We've been in this series called We the Church now for uh, a month and a half, and uh, while we were there, we've been looking at this passage of Scripture, a famous passage. Peter preaches this message, and he has this passage that's in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It's on your screen, and it says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together. They held all things in common. They sold their possessions, their properties. They distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. They broke bread in house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all people. Every day the Lord added to their numbers those being saved. Today we want to focus on verse 44 of this. And it says that uh, in verse 44 that now all believers were together and held all things in common. If you haven't been part of this series, we've been breaking apart each of these. They devoted themselves. They, they, they literally centered um, their devotion around the teaching of who Jesus was and, and what Jesus did and what he brought. They devoted themselves to that. They devoted themselves to fellowship. And, and, and I know fellowship isn't a, a word we, we really use as much anymore, but it's this idea of people being together that hold this, this common core belief system that are there helping each other and being part of them and, and, and being in this, this unified church body, this, this unified this, this fellowship. The actual word for that is koinonia, which is this, this Greek word that means this, this true deep fellowship. It's more than just coffee and donuts. It's this deep fellowship. They devoted themselves to this deep fellowship. To the breaking of bread, which is communion and, and the Lord's Supper, to this idea of prayer. And you see later in chapter 4 how that prayer shook the very foundation of who they are. If you were with us last week, we talked about this word awe, about being in worship with God, this matter of, of being in, in true awe-inspiring worship of God, these moments when you, when you have that. Today, we're going to look at this idea of they held everything. Uh, now, all the believers were together and held all things in common. The implication here is this word unity. But sometimes when we talk about unity or we think about unity, and maybe your mind doesn't go here, but mine does, it's just like, well, you got to submit, fall into line, everybody has to conform to be this certain way and act this certain way and, and, and have this thing. It's like you're this mindless robots that just need to conform, and then you can unify because it's this more of a conformity. The Gospel Coalition gives a really good definition of unity, and it says this, the unity of the church refers to the union of the people of God and their various distinctions and expressions bound to God and to one another by the gospel. It's this thing that the, the complexity of, of the church, the, the unity of the church is yet this, this beautiful unifying peace because we unify around who God is but yet, in all of its distinct ways that, that we look, the, the distinctions and the expressions of, of, of who we are. There's thousands and thousands of churches that will meet this weekend, and they look different, and they do things different. There's some that are very what they would call liturgical, which is you would re recite like the Apostles' Creeds and, 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 uh, and you, would, you would be very stoic kind of in your service. There's others like ours that's a little more laid back and there's worship bands. There's some today that are meeting with, with pipe organs and singing hymns straight out of a book. There's, there's, there's churches that are of different cultures and different ethnicities that are all meeting together today. And there's all these different distinctions of the church but as long as they're centered around who God is, there's a unifying force with it. So it's this collective and diverse group of people who come together all around the central cores of belief. A couple weeks ago, um, we talked about this idea of fellowship and uh, talked about how our fellowship... There's these things for true fellowship that, that we center around. There's these beliefs. There's these uh, uh, convictions and behaviors. And actually, I have a slide, Amber, if you help me out, that, that goes up here that I kind of do this. There's these ideas of beliefs, these, these things that we hold true, like the Trinity. 
that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the, the absolute truth of Scripture, this is the inspired, unquestioned um, doctrine of, of Scripture. Like, this is the truth of Scripture. We talk about the virgin birth. We talk about a literal resurrection for Jesus. We talk about that salvation is by grace through faith alone, that Jesus is the only way to forgiveness of sins. Talk about free will. These are these things that can't change. Because when you start to alter and change these, if you're with us, you, it changes everything. I think that week I talked about the virgin birth. Like, what does it matter if Mary was a virgin or not a virgin? Or It changes everything because it changes the whole nature and character of who Jesus is. If Mary was and Joseph had Jesus and, and God um, hadn't through the Spirit created this virgin birth, then Jesus... Maybe. Hey, there we go. There. Thanks for waiting with us. Virgin birth, you, you, if Mary wasn't, if Jesus wasn't conceived through the Holy Spirit, you, you lose the two natures of who Jesus is. He's not fully man and fully God. And so his sacrifice on the cross would mean nothing. That's why it's important to have these things. These are the cores, the foundation, the, the, the building blocks of everything we do or some of these things. There's convictions that we have. Um, and these change a little bit. Um, um, like we sometimes debate about them, but it's these things that are, are, are absolute still truths to us, but, but it's a little bit different. Gifts of the Spirit, uh, stuff like abortion, homosexuality, identity, marriage, family, communion, baptism. Some of these things are, are still things that are very important to us, things that aren't less important than what these others are, but they're not necessarily categorized in beliefs. And then you have behaviors, things like uh, politics and, and social drinking and Halloween and, and stuff, and you see these different things. One of the best ways that I could give you to understand this piece of this is if you look at the beliefs as the, the foundation, if you're building a house and you put these blocks and foundations down that are, are the, the solid center for everything the house is going to be built on, that's what the beliefs are. And then you start to construct walls, perimeters, things that keep us safe, things that are, that are within these walls and those are the things that are the convictions, the things that we hold dear, the things that are important to us, the things that are still structurally helping this house stand. And then how you decorate a room would be more of the behaviors. If you've had kids, um, I know for our family, each one of our kids has wanted to decorate their room different. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just different, but it's all under the same house. Those are the things that can happen. But what happens in churches is, and one of the biggest things that helps create disunity in churches, we start taking behaviors and making those the foundations that we build everything on. So whether it's politics on whose side of the, the pole you're on, whether it's the, the red or blue, and whether you're following an elephant or following a donkey, like we, we make those the center part of what Christianity is or other things. I, I remember... Um, I pastored, it wasn't at this church, it was at a former church, and I almost said the name, and I'm not going to say the name because we record these and put them online. Um, I had more people fight with me over the tattoos I have on my body than anything else. It's crazy. Like, they would come to me, and they were like, oh, you got another tattoo, well, you know, and then they would start throwing scripture out that they were misinterpreting and all this kind of stuff, and it was just interesting, like, that's what people wanted to debate with me, and that's why... When we start to make behaviors more important than anything else, the unity of the church starts to break. It starts to crack. We start to not be able to sit into a room or, man, I don't want to talk to this person. And, 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 and I've seen it throughout the church. You know there has been churches that have split over changing the color of the carpet in a sanctuary. Not if Jesus is the only way to heaven even though he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except for me. Now, they're not going to debate the importance of Jesus in Scripture. 
They're going to debate because somebody wanted this color and somebody wanted another color, and so their church now is split. It's crazy. Before I came to uh, Crossway, there was another church that we were interviewing at, and um, we chose Crossway, obviously, because we're still here. Um, uh, that church had, two years later, went through a major split because they couldn't decide if they were going to sing hymns or if they were going to sing worship songs. So the church split. Because they've built their foundation on behaviors instead of building their foundation on Jesus. And why I say all of this and why it's so important to come back and touch this is, is that if we want to be together and hold all things in common, the church needs to, and here's the bottom line, the church needs to unite be united in diversity. The church needs unity in diversity. We need to unite around some things. There's two passages of scripture. If you have your Bible, you can pull it out. If you don't have your Bible, there's some that are under your, your seat, but there's two passages of scripture I really want to go to today. The first one's in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter four. If you have your Bible, turn to me. We can read some of this. I want to unpack this thing that are in this. If you get to Galatians, it's Galatians, Ephesians. If you're Philippians, you've gone too far. But Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're going to start. And let me, let me give you a, a point to, to what this, chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Ephesians are leading up to something that happens. Because when you're in chapters 1, 2, and 3, it's, it's all talking about the belief system that we have. And then all of a sudden in chapter, chapter 4, it switches to this mission kind of statement, the mission. Ephesians 4, uh, it starts with this word that says, therefore, um, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord. The reason he's saying therefore is that he has just prayed in chapter 3 that the spiritual power that would be there. He's talking about unity in Christ. He's talking about coming from death to life. He's talking about God's power in Christ. He's talking about how God has subject everything under Jesus' feet. He's doing all this stuff. He prays this prayer. Actually, verse or chapter 3, verse 16, he's like, you know, that we would have these riches and glories and strength with the power of our innermost being that we can dwell in all this. He's, he's setting all of this up, and he was saying, therefore, I, chapter 4, verse 1, prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility And gentleness and patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the, the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Now stop there for a second with me. He's saying, look, we live worthy of the calling. If we, if we claim the name of Christianity, if we say we're Christ followers, if we say we're a Christian, we live worthy of that calling. And so how do we live worthy of that calling? And he gives us four things. He says it's about being gentle. It's about being patient. It's about bearing with one another and, and love, having love for one another. These are the things that we struggle for. It was actually interesting because we were, I was talking with someone, but the other day I, I get so frustrated driving and I'm trying really hard not to get so frustrated driving. It makes it really hard around here. And I, I took Ella Claire to work and I was coming back and it doesn't help that we just switched our insurance and I have this stupid monitoring device on my phone that if you brake too hard or if you speed up too hard or if you drive after a certain time, like it gives you all these things and we don't get a discount. And so I'm trying to be better. I really am. I want to be better. And this lady, there's like, you have the, the, I was coming down 611 and I was getting ready to cross county line and you have the two lanes that are going through and then you have the left turn lane that turns on the county line. If you know that light and if you're heading, I believe that's north, they get to turn first. But if you're heading south, you have to, that, that turn lane gets delayed. And so they wait. So I switch lanes and I'm in the middle and the wonderful person in front of me decides to you know what, I think I want to turn now. And so they, they kind of half went in the turn lane, but then half blocked my lane. And if you know 611 at 4, 5, 6 o'clock at night, it's crazy. And so here I am stuck. And I just left Chick-fil-A with dropping Ella off. And I was like, you know what, I need to be patient because there's a lot of traffic. And then I'm sitting here just like stewing. <sighs> Can't take it. So I get it when we hear these things and, and what's happening here as it's been running. Like this, this uh, Paul is telling us like we have humility and gentleness and patience. These are hard things. It is. 
Maybe not for you. Maybe you're the most patient, humble, gentle person that's in this world, and I hope you are, and that's great. I need to learn from you. But for a lot of us, sometimes these things aren't there. Bearing with one another in love. One of the best things that we can do to unify the church is kind of set aside our agendas and just come together. Other places, God says that, that the, the world will know we're his disciples by how we love. Make every effort, verse 3, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We make every effort to keep unity within the church. And then he gives us some more. In verse 4, if you have it, let's keep reading just a few moments. It says, there is one body, one spirit, just as we were called by, to one hope at your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. There are seven ones that he kind of gives us here. Seven things. There's one God. There's one body, meaning his church. There's one spirit. You're called to one hope. At your calling, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. He's, he's saying there's these things that unite us, these pillars that we have to build on, this foundation of beliefs that we have to do this. If you go down to verse 11, then he says, he says this. He says, and, and he himself... Gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the works of the ministry to build the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. There's a lot that's in this. But there's the structure that comes with the body. There's those that are great at... at, at being apostles, being the ones that are declaring Christ and, and, and shouting it from the, the rooftops. There's those that are good at being evangelists and, and those that are good at, at, at all of these different things. And there's some that are good at teaching. There's some that aren't good at teaching. There's all of these things. But God has given us all of these things so that we can grow in unity as a church to be one. What's sad is, is that... It, I'm not saying it's, 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 it's our church, but I think there's a problem that's happening in churches where there's more disunity in the church than there is unity. And I look at this first church, and part of the things that I think why God was, was adding to the numbers and, and, and helping people not just grow a big church, but to have people that actually would have life change and would be saved is because of the unity that's within the church. We need maturity. It's measured in Christ's fullness. In verse 14, it says that there uh, will no longer be little children tossed waves blowing around like by every wind of teaching and human and all of this stuff. But we'll speak the truth in love. Let us grow in every way into him. If you keep reading through Ephesians, it, it, it continues by saying, like, we got to get rid of the old junk, the old stuff that we carried before Christ. We have to unify and be as one. It's his church. We unify around that. It's this foundation that we're built on. But in the same token, I love, and that's why I wanted you to go with me real quick. I'll be quick, I promise. To 1 Corinthians, because there's this idea of diversity that we see in Scripture. And I love it, because we're not all the same. If we were all the same, things would look a lot different. So if you were in Galatians and you go backwards a few books, you find yourself in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, we're going to be in verse, or chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. I would tell you a page number, but none of you have the same Bible as me, so it doesn't matter. In verse 4, it says this. It says, Now there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. There's diversity in the church. 
That's why we have children's ministry and youth ministry. It's why there's sometimes Bible studies for women, and it's why we sometimes do parenting classes. There's all this diversity that's in there. But what's amazing is in all of this, he's like, there's different gifts that we have. People have different gifts. I'm glad that Susan is, has the gift of hospitality because I don't. I'm not a very hospitable person always. Like, it doesn't always happen. That, like, I'm a person that speaks more grace and, 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 and kind of comes at people hard, and she has this compassionate heart, and so there's this balance. I'm glad we're both not like that because it would just be, it'd be rough. My, my personality is, is uh, kind of quick-witted. We've talked about this, but sometimes passive-aggressive. Aren't you glad we're all not just passive aggressive in here? I mean, it'd be miserable. But that's not how we're designed. That's not how we're made. That's not how we're doing. We have all of these different things, these different gifts, these different ministries, these different activities. We had a blast yesterday. There was like, I think, 18 of us men that showed up and just sat around and ate bacon. Like, it was good. <clears throat> it was good. We have these different things. And in verse 12, he says this, so just as the body is one, talking about this unity, and has many parts, all the parts of the body, though many are one body, as also in Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into the body. Whether we're Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we are all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. I love as this passage goes on, and if you want to read it later today, it talks about the importance of like the ear and the eye and the foot and the hand, how we need all of these different things. You know, you, you lose a foot, it, it throws your balance off. You know? Kurt, when you cut your hand and you had no use of it for quite a while and still struggle with it. it. It adjusts everything he has to do now when he works with stuff because his hand got changed. And, and what this passage is saying is God has designed some of us to just be a hand or a foot or an ear or an eye. And we can't say, you know what, man, I kind of want to be this instead. No, because when that all comes together, the diversity of what the church is comes together as one, and we do the functions, it's this beautiful thing that's there. And what we see in the first church is this beautiful mix of, of diversity unified around who God was and what he was doing. It says, second part of verse 24, instead God has put the body together, giving great honor to less honorable so that there's no division in the body. But the members would have some concern for each other, would have the same concern for each other. Excuse me, I read that wrong. So if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and the individual members of it. There's this beautiful picture that's happening in Scripture of this unified church that's diverse, that knows its roles, that understands who it is, and is working together. And they're gentle and humble and loving one another. And they're putting up with each other. I've spoke about this before, but I want to close today, and then we have some baptisms. I know Susan's going to leave, or Sandy's going to leave, or someone's going to leave to get our kids, and, and that'll be Susan, <clears throat> and bring them back up. But we see this with Jesus. Jesus chose 12 guys to follow him, to pour into, to disciple him. And I, I've shared this before, but I, I find it so profound. Because two of the guys he chose was Matthew the tax collector, and the other one was Simon the zealot. And sometimes we read through this, and we read through it quick, and we don't really look into Scripture. But secondary names matter a lot. In scripture. So let me tell you a little bit about Matthew, the tax collector. So what would happen was there's this, this tyranny that works. There were these chief tax collectors, and they were uh, living by setting the taxes. They knew what needed to come in to go to Rome, and so they would set a tax. 
Well, what was proper for them then was to make sure that they would set off of those taxes they took enough for them to live. And so they would get, uh, they would say it. So if, if, if your tax was a dollar, they would set it at a dollar fifty because they would get the 50 cents they would send on. That was the first, the chief tax collector. What we don't realize is after that, there would be a second tax collector that was kind of the middleman. And so what he would do was he would go and have people and collect some taxes, but actually have a third one underneath him, and each one would do the same thing. So you follow me? There would be three different layers. The top guy would just collect it from all of them. But what was happening was for Rome, your tax would actually have three different levels of taxes placed on it. Because everybody had to get their cut. And so it made people mad about Rome. Like they hated it. They absolutely hated about that. That was how the system was set up. I'm not saying Matthew was a bad guy. I'm just saying this was the system they worked in. This is what it was. This is what was honorable for that day. Matthew, tax collector from Rome. They would tax the people a bit more each time, increasing the amount that it was actually supposed to be given so that they could do this. But what often happened was most of the time, the chief tax collectors and even that second one became pretty wealthy people. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? He's a tax collector. He'd been robbing people. He'd been setting in extorting people. So you have this guy that works for Rome, Matthew. Well, here's the flip side. Simon the Zealot. They were people who wanted to overthrow Rome. They hated Rome. They actually would organize to start to, to, to try to overthrow Rome. They felt that they wanted to purify the land from the Roman government. And they felt paying taxes to Rome was a sin because it supported the enemy's government. I love how Jesus took two diverse people and brought them together. We don't talk about these. We just think like, man, all of these 12 guys were these like just, you know, upstanding citizens that, that were these like normal people that just always grew up in church and did this. And, and it really wasn't that way. He took 12 guys from, from different backgrounds. Some of them fished. Some of them were tax collectors. Some of them were trying to overthrow a government. <laughs> All these people, and they brought them together together. And you realize the first church, the one we're studying in Acts chapter 2, was through these guys. Unity in the church is so important. But we're not mindless. We're not just asking everybody to conform and fall into a line because we are one of the most diverse groups of people. I can't wait till we get to heaven someday. Because I think the church is going to be this beautiful mixing pot of people and race and nations and preferences. And we're not going to fight about carpet and we're not going to fight about styles of music and we're not going to fight about tattoos. And we're going to worship the true God for the foundation that he is. It's going to be good. The church needs unity in its diversity. And we're a part of doing that. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to come here today, to sing about you, to worship with you, to be a part of you. God, I pray that the church becomes unified. That Crossway is a, is a place that is of unity together. But we're also a very diverse place, using the gifts, the talents, what you have created us to be so that people can come to know who you are. People can, can choose to follow you and people can have their lives transformed by you. God, I thank you that we get to celebrate baptism here in a moment. People who have chosen to have their lives transformed by you. Chosen to have a public display today that says that they love you. 
And they want others to know that they love you and have chosen to follow you. God, we thank you for that. We give you all the praise and honor and glory. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen.